welcome to the latest episode of the Jaguar Report podcast. I'm here with uh, Treeb. Treeb, say what's up to the folks. What's going on, everybody? It's Treeb from Treeb Talks here, and I'm excited, as always, to be on the Jaguar Report podcast with my guy, John. John, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good, man. It's been a busy couple weeks for uh, Jaguars news, uh, as you know, and as I'm sure all the listeners know, you know, it's really it kind of seems even when there's an off season that really doesn't stop especially for the Jaguars I mean it just there's been countless things you know from uh, the really coaching retainment and the coaching firings and the hall of fame stuff and then all this London news over the past uh, you know two days so we're going to make sure to you know really hit all of that uh, we're, we're happy to be back uh, happy as always to have you guys listening uh, you know, we've been making sure that we're going to be doing this podcast throughout the off season, just as we were during the regular season. And we're going to keep bringing you guys daily content on JaguarReport.com. Uh, you know, you can find articles on really, in my opinion, everything that you can think of for a Jaguars fan, whether it's from the roster to the coaching to the front office to the NFL draft. We try to have you covered. So. Uh, Treeb, uh, you know, as as we both know, kind of the big elephant in the room. Uh, yesterday, the Jaguars announced that they would be taking two home games overseas to London next year. Play, they'll be playing two home games back to back at Wembley Stadium. I was uh, on a conference call with uh, most of the other local media, with Team President Mark Lamping and owner Shad Khan, as they talked about the decision. Lamping said that uh, the two games that are absolutely not going to be London games that are supposed to be home games for the Jaguars are against the Chicago Bears and the Pittsburgh Steelers, two pretty marquee fan bases. So it makes sense they want to protect those two games. But a lot of people had a lot of had a lot of had a lot of opinions on it. Treeb, just what what was your uh, initial reaction, and has your reaction really changed much? Uh, you know, in the time since you've heard the news. My initial reaction was that uh, being a person that's not from Jacksonville, uh, me personally, I don't, I didn't get really affected by it at first when I first heard it on uh, JaguarReport.com. Um, I even posted a tweet about it saying, you know, it, it sucks, but I'm not from the area. So, you know, it doesn't bother me too much. And immediately when I got on Twitter, I seen, you know, fans reaction, other people that are in the media's reaction and, you know, there, people are talking about how this is going to help Jacksonville as a whole, help the team as a whole, but it hurts Jacksonville. And it hurts the fan base of the Jacksonville Jaguars. And, you know, it's crazy to see kind of the reactions from people that, you know, have been fans of this team for so long, have had season tickets for so long. I think, I think it does a lot more harm to the Jaguars than it does good. And, you know, you see a lot of people – talking about how you know Jaguar fans shouldn't be reacting the way that they are but I mean you pay for season tickets you want to get those home games and you know to get two of them removed from you know the schedule that's a big big deal to a lot of diehard fans and yeah it's a big, it's a big deal for me as well because you know uh to watch those games I'm going to be having to get up at 6 a.m so yeah. <laughs> Florida people don't know how spoiled you are thinking that with you early wake-up call yeah no for sure I mean when you put it in the context of you know just saying two home games out loud maybe that doesn't seem like a ton to most people but I mean it's literally 25 percent fewer home games than a regular NFL team gets and these are called home games in London because the Jaguars are a designated home team but it's not a home game in any sense of the word you know it's basically they're going to be playing six home games in 10 games on the road because they're not going to be playing in front of a fan base that's on their side. And they're going to have to travel literally overseas for this. And to, to say this move is unprecedented would be kind of an understatement. I mean, it's the first time in NFL history that a team's going to play two home games outside of the United States in one season. Uh, it's the first time a team's ever going to play two games in London in one season. It's, it's basically a first for any NFL team to say, okay, We're going to take a quarter of our team's home games and literally take them overseas to an entire different continent and play them there. It's so I I think when it was met with an unprecedented negative response, I don't think that's surprising because you're doing something that really, I mean, even the one London game since 2013, I just from my perspective as somebody who reports on the team, I see that as something a lot of fans have kind of swallowed and been like, okay, well, we're not enthusiastic about this, but we're going to go ahead and live with it. 
it really seemed like two games was kind of like a tipping point, you know, like that's, that's something that to them, I think is really non-negotiable. Um, of course, it's important to point out that as of right now, the London games, the two games in London are only for 2020. That's the agreement they have with the NFL league office. And in general, the Jaguars agreement to play annually in London actually ends in 2020. So while Shad Khan has said before that he wants to get a new agreement in place, uh, there has yet to been one. And at like, say the season ended, 2020 season ended tomorrow and there was no agreement in place, the Jaguars won't be playing any games in London in 2021. So they still have to get that sorted out. And I think, Treve, that's actually one thing a lot of people haven't been thinking about is for London, it takes two to tango, you know? Like the Jags can do it all they want. They need the NFL's actual, like, approval to go ahead and do it so I think as you know justifiably upset as some people are at you know local decisions you also got to look at the NFL who's basically kind of trying to like dip dip their toes in international waters and they're basically using the Jaguars as a way to kind of you know uh practice at that that that's at least how I see it from my outside perspective I mean does that make sense to you yeah, and it, and it makes sense that the NFL would choose choose the Jaguars. You know, sometimes, you know, I, li- I like to be professional in these kind of things, but I like kind of the fans' perspective I can bring sometimes to these podcasts. And it just seems like the NFL and the Jaguars can never get out of their own way with these situations. Like you said, it doesn't go just through the Jaguars. It goes through the NFL as well. They're not going to send a team like the New England Patriots to London twice a year. They're not going to send the Cowboys. Those are teams in huge markets. They're using the Jaguars as, you know, like almost like a sacrificial lamb to see like, oh, is this going to work? Like, is this going to be like something that we can do to get more money in the pockets of, you know, these billionaires that run the NFL, you know, the team as a whole. And it just, it seems like with the London move, the NFL is sacrificing the Jaguars who are notable for not winning a lot of football games, not being one of the bigger markets in the NFL and a team that likes to get in their own way very, very often. So it just, it makes a lot of sense why the Jaguars are chosen to be the sacrificial lamb to go to these two London games. And, you know, like you said, it's justifiable for fans to be really upset with this move. And, and I don't, I don't see any positives that, um, at least in the eyes of a fan base, can really take away from, you know, having two games in London. And it, it may, and like you said with the NFL thing, it makes a lot of sense that the Jaguars were the team to pick for this. Yeah, of course. And I think I think the positives that the Jaguars want people to see is, one, that as of now, this is simply a one-year thing. And, you know, Lamping and Khan really stress that they're using this as something to kind of use as a revenue source while they're bridging over uh, some time for Lot J developments. Uh, Being anybody really from outside of Jacksonville, Lot J is going to be literally white noise to you. (laughs) It doesn't mean anything. Lot J is a, is a developmental lot near TIAA bank field in downtown Jacksonville that the Jaguars and several other partners are really tasked with uh, revitalizing. They're trying to put a lot of stuff down there. And I mean, maybe even potentially down the road, maybe even a new stadium, so they're trying really to be like, okay, this part of downtown is going to be our big revenue stream once it's complete. But as of right now, it's just a vision. So we're going to use London and an additional London game to really kind of bridge that gap in between it being a vision and it being a reality. And I mean, when you talk about dollars and cents, it is not even an argument, obviously. It's an obvious, it's not a, it's a fact, it's not an opinion. The Jaguars make more money from London games than they do in Jacksonville. You know, I mean, there's more people at the game. They get all the ticket money that they simply make more money. And that's obviously the big reason why why they are doing it, because it helps them with local revenue, because all London games that they play in count toward their own local revenue. But, I mean, at the same time, when you announce that to a fan base, I don't think they care (laughs) about revenue, dude. I, I, I I don't think they care at all where the team ranks in local revenue because no sports team, at least none that I know of are, you know, going flat broke. So I think when you make that argument that, Hey, we're using this to stabilize our team's revenue. I think that's one that kind of falls upon deaf ears. Does that make sense? Well, I I agree with that a hundred percent. And then, you know, Shad Khan goes out, releases that statement and says, you know, the priority is winning. He keeps on saying that, like that's a top priority. But when you are a team that goes to London once a year, 
you're a team that doesn't win a lot of football games, and now you're a team that is going to try out this new system of going to two games in London, and if the Jaguars' luck is anything to go by, the potential to, like, move to London, you know, I'm not saying that's going to happen or it even has a potential of happening, but, you know, it's there, it's in the air, it's been spoken about, but it makes it hard to retain these players. It makes it hard for this to be an attractive place for NFL players to want to come to, you know, to sign that fifth-year option. You know, guys like Yannick Ngakwe, you think when he heard this news that they're going to be playing a second game in London, do you think that yeah. that's going to help That it him? made him want to stay in Jacksonville? Yeah, that's yeah. not going to make him want to stay in Jacksonville at all. Then you look at guys like people that they draft, that, you know, they want to be workhorses for a long time. If they still have this whole ideal going on that – the money is more important than winning football and it's more important than, you know, having these players stick around, then this is going to be a team that not only in Jacksonville won't continue anymore, but might not even continue in the NFL anymore. And it it just seems like a really bad choice. Do I see why they did it in a business standpoint? Sure. But as far as a football standpoint and for the fans, this was a historically bad decision. in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's a big thing. From a business standpoint, it makes sense. You know, it, it really does. But NFL football fans, you know, people who have really lived and died with this team since it first came to Jacksonville over 25 years ago, they don't want, they don't want to hear about it from a business sense. You know, they, they, they're they already being treated different than most other fan bases are by their home teams. And I think that's another reason that fans are really kind of outraged, at least from what I've seen. Uh, in my time following the team, they already had to fight off a lot of narratives about, hey, uh, you know, the Jaguars don't have any passionate fans. Nobody comes to their games. They already have to fight those narratives on their own. And announcing that a game is being taken from them and sent to London so that the team can be financially viable, that only kind of stokes those flames, at least in my eyes. So I think that's another reason people probably aren't too happy. And I, I think it would be fair to point out that, uh, both Con and Lamping have said, you know, numerous times, and they said again on Tuesday, that the reason this is being done is to keep the Jaguars in Jacksonville and to ensure stability over here in Northeast Florida. On, on the surface, I do believe that. I do believe that basically this is a way for them to kind of stay in Jacksonville and, you know, stay with the status quo. And I do believe it helps financially toward that. Uh, I'm not of the belief that they're attempting to move the team at all. But at the end of the day, that that doesn't make a pill e- any easier to swallow, you know, for fans when they're only seeing, you know, 75% of the home games that every other fan base has seen. So, well, go ahead. I'm, I'm not, you know, well-versed in how financially, like, this team can stay afloat in Jacksonville. Is that, like, a worry? Like, is it, like, a deal where, like, the town might not even be able to support this team in a couple of years so they really need this money? Or is that not a worry really at all? I mean, they're a small market. Uh, they're bottom quartile in the league and revenue generated. But they're typically about 20 to 25th uh, in attendance. And, I mean, Khan bought the team for $750 million in 2012. And now Forbes values it at over $2 billion. So, I think the team's gone up in value. Um, he's, made a, he's made a ton of investments in Jacksonville, uh, like – Uh, over $70 million from his own pocket toward investments in Jacksonville, you know, really uh, for the stadium specifically, and then add on to his Lot J stuff. He has spent a lot of money in Jacksonville, which is another reason I don't think that they are going to officially move, move. But I I think that to make them more, say, competitive with other teams in terms of revenue, I, I I think it could maybe be a question, but at the end of the day, is your team going to make a lot of money when you're bad on the field every year? I mean, yeah, they, that's, they, they've that's had exactly one win. It. Yeah, they've had one season of double digit wins in the last plus decade. So, is it Jacksonville that's the problem, or is it bad football that's the problem? I think that's I think that's you know the real question there. And you know, because Colin and I and I said this you know in a podcast before, where from a perspective, it seems like. Khan doesn't care about the football product on the field. I'm not saying he does it. I'm not going to go out on a limb and say that. But with some of the moves he makes and with some of the decisions he makes with not only the personnel, the coaching that he keeps, or, you know, with this whole deal going to two games in London, but it's like 
when the Jaguars were in the playoffs in 2017, I'd seen the pictures. I'd seen everything. Like, there were so many fans in those seats. You had so many exciting fans. And I guarantee you that the revenue you made from that was extensively better than when you throw out a crap product on the field. Yeah. I understand that you want to get this revenue and going to London is going to get you that. But why don't you put more of the focus on the sport you're playing, hiring yeah. personnel that is going to help you win, trying to get players on the field that want to be here, be an attractive des designation for players mm -hmm. to want to play football here. I think that Khan is worried about getting revenue in the wrong ways when he is more of a businessman and not a guy that wants to improve this football team on the field. Yeah, and that's understandable. And, and just from my perspective, I do think that he wants to uh, have, you know, a winning football team. I think, you know, be, being an owner, at least in my eyes, a lot of it is, I, I don't want to say ego, but it's pride. You know, you want to have pride that you have a successful team that other franchises look up to. You know, you want to you be Robert Kraft. You want to be Jerry Jones. You know, you want to be those kind of people. And I, I think having a winning football team is important to Con. Uh, you know, there have been a ton of reports that during those first couple of years in Jacksonville, he was embarrassed, you know, really by the team's performance. And I, so I do think that they want to have a winning record. It's just you have to actually, at the end of the day, you know, you got to have a little less, I think, patience with it. Because that's my big thing. I think he has yeah. a lot of patience to for things to kind of turn around on their own. Because, you know, he said yesterday that winning is the top priority. You can't really argue that winning is the top priority when you bring back all but your executive vice president and your offensive coordinator from two consecutive, uh, you know, double-digit loss seasons. It's just, a, it's just a fallacy at that point. So that's the big thing. I, I'm of the belief that he wants to win. But at the end of the day, you have to make the actions. You know what I mean? And I think – Go ahead. Sorry. I don't. I feel like I've interrupted you a lot in this podcast. I don't mean to. But, <laughs> no, you're good. You know, you know uh, and I think a part of it is, you know, Khan kind of came, at least from my understanding, I think he kind of came from the bottom, you know, when he was growing up and he built his way up. So I think, like, a lot of patience was involved with yeah. his upbringing. He's a self, so I think, yeah, he's a self-made guy. So I think with how he was raised and how he made, you know, his billions, millions, got his yacht, you know, like – Shad Khan came from nothing and wants to be something. So I think he's really patient in the fact that, you know, sure they're not producing on the field, but maybe if I give them some time, give them some time, then it's going to develop. But I mean, this is a league where, you know, it's a rotating door. Like you need to find people that can help you win now. Like yeah. you don't build dynasties on accident. Like, yeah. I mean, I get that New England wasn't a dynasty like right out of the gate, but they found the right people. They got the pieces together. And They're not going to get it sticking with the same core guys. And I think that's that's the one thing. Uh, you know, when you're talking about patience with owners, no matter how bad a team does, unless they're doing like astron astronomically bad uh, financial wise, the owner is going to remain the same. You know, I mean, yeah. the, the Browns just went 0 and 16, and then 1 and 15 in a two year span. Uh, everybody got fired, but the owner is still the same guy. So I think that's another reason some owners might have a lot of patience because don't let it like get mistaken that Khan is the only owner with patience in the NFL. He's not. There's, there's really kind of two ways to be an owner. You can be really patient. Or you can be really quick on the trigger. And it's about a 50-50 split. I mean, you just saw, you know, Jerry Jones, he took like two and a half weeks to fire Jason that's Garrett facts. when we all knew he was fired in like November. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I was literally waiting like every day to see when he was actually going to get fired. It, it was amazing that I, it was at least a week after the season, maybe a week and a half. And then I, I, I think the big thing is when you consider this decision is you can't just consider how the fans will react to it. You can't just consider the financial impact of it. I think you have to consider the 53 guys on the field and the coaching staff. I think that you have to consider, is this something – they want is it appealing to them because i mean you go on social media yesterday and you hear from a lot of players both former jaguars players and just regular players who have never played a down for jacksonville that said hey we wouldn't be fans of this uh matt overton former long snapper for the jaguars he's played in three london games he played in london with the colts in 2016 coincidentally against the jaguars and then in london for the jaguars in 2017 and 2018 he, he went on the record on Twitter to say that 
He thinks it's a screw you, the fans. He thinks that the entire trip is exhausting on players and will take a physical toll. And that he just does not really support it. And then you saw Jalen Ramsey, who also played three London games, all with the Jaguars. Uh, Ramsey's going to take any shot he yeah. possibly can at exactly. the Jaguars organization. That can't really be understated. No. If the Jaguars leave an opening, he's going to take it. But even he went on Twitter, you know, really to say, hey, I'm glad I'm not where I used to be anymore. And that was met with a lot of justifiable uh, criticism from Jaguars fans because, as I said, Ram is going to crack on anything that Jaguars do. But at least in this instance, he has some credibility on the topic. You know, he's been to London before. He knows what kind of toll it is on a player. And then Golden Tate, he's never played a down for the Jaguars. He literally tweeted, hey, it's good for the U.K. and uh, the NFL, but it sucks for players and their families. And I think when you consider those perspectives, it's probably likely that those opinions are shared within the Jaguars locker room. And now those guys have to play in London back-to-back weeks, spend two weeks there. They have really no choice in the matter. And so it's something they're going to have to grow used to. You know, I mean, athletes are creatures of habit. So this is going to be a complete shift from how they normally do things. Uh, Any competitive advantage the Jaguars had in terms of logistics in London, I think that goes out the window because no team's ever spent two weeks in London. You, you, You have no real rule book to pull from. You have no experience doing this just because you've played in London since 2013. So I I just think when you talk to current Jaguars players or former Jaguars players and even potential free agents, I'm not sure this is going to be the most positive move for a a couple different reasons. And I think that's one thing that's kind of flown under a radar tree is how how do the 53 guys on the field think about it? Yeah. And I think you hit the nail around the head with everything you said. And, you know, it kind of goes back to what I said with players that, you know, our free agents or potential draft prospects for the Jags. Like, how attractive is a landing place with the Jaguars where they're going to be doing this move and, you know, in a sense, seems like they're worried more about the business end of things as opposed to the, you know, football operations. You know, it, it, it goes back to that. And the people that are currently on the roster, you know, there could be things that you could do maybe to get, you know, mentally ready to be in London for for that you can do certain things to be physically ready you can try and do something but at the end of the day this is not an ideal move for the players it's not an ideal move for the fans and it goes back to being a business thing and them not ca- not necessarily not caring but you know kind of you know not appealing to the fans or not appealing to the players that they currently have on its roster so i would agree with that yeah no for sure and I think another thing people aren't thinking about, uh, United Kingdom tax laws with athletes are pretty wild. You know, it, this this was something I didn't even uh, really uh, look into until now because I had really no no reason to. But, I mean, just consider the fact that Great Britain, they levy, like, heavy taxes on visiting athletes, and it's prorated on how many days you're visiting. So Jaguars players, you know, that, that game check that they get from London, a good bit a good bit of that goes back in taxes, and that's based on how many days they're there. They have to spend even more days now, and now it's even a second check. So I, I just think that's stuff that you have to consider when you look at how this could impact the Jaguars because I think it impacts them more than financially. I think it impacts them more than in the eyes of the fan base. I think it impacts those guys that really make wins and losses happen. And those are guys I think have not been talked enough about in this decision. You know, I, I would love to know, uh, you know, if players were, were approached with this idea at any point. I, I, I would because it's something that I, I'm just not sure that they'd be too enthusiastic about. But I'm, I'm excited for them all to get back after the offseason in the locker room to ask them because I think it's going to be one of the more hot button topics uh, really throughout the season. The fact that they're going to be playing two games over in London. but really I think what this comes down to is I do believe that you know they want to keep the Jaguars in Jacksonville Uh, I don't have a really a shred of doubt of that in my mind but they're still doing something unprecedented and when you do something like that you get unprecedented reactions and uh, people are going to naturally raise their eyebrows and raise questions so I think at the end of the day you make a decision as they did and you kind of you know have to lie in the bed that you made 
Yeah, and I want to shout out my boy John for that tax stat. Like, who <laughs> who would have just thought about that, dude? That's wild. I didn't even – that's not even something that crossed my mind. Yeah, yeah, we dude. We talked about that. Well, dude. I, I, I got to give credit to uh, Mike DeRocco with ESPN. He was the oh. first one that treated about it. He said, like, uh, players get heavy, t- heavily taxed in London. And he said that Jaguars players had grumbled about it before. And that's when I started doing my research and I saw, like, the exact specifics of it. And when I saw it was literally based on how many days that you spend there, I was like, geez, man, adding another at least seven days to that, that's that's a decent amount of money. And th- this isn't meant to be like, oh, you know, poor them, they have no money, because obviously the multimillionaire athletes. But just from their perspective, they're going to be losing money, really, so the team can make it. So I, I think that's really the perspective. And I think that the team already – has to consider its relationships with not only their own players, but players throughout the league because of that whole NFL PA fiasco from a few months ago. I mean, if, if you're a free agent and one month you see the NFL PA come out with that statement and then the next month you see this, how appealing of a landing spot is that for you? And if it is a landing spot you want to be in, how much do they have to overpay you? You know what I mean? I know. I was, I was literally over here, like, flailing on my arms. Like, I can't even tell you. Like, that's – That's exactly what I'm saying. Like, the two biggest pieces to a football franchise are the players on the field and the fans that show out to the game. And this is a move that doesn't appeal to either one of those. And you take into account that, you know, everything you just said, you take that into account, you know, players are losing money going overseas. They're not getting an opportunity, you know, they're just, they're getting money, not necessarily taken away from them, but they're, you know, losing money. It's hurting them and it's hurting the fans because, you know, no one can afford to just go over to London and watch this game. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a bad move for, you know, the two pieces that really make. I mean, NFL I, I had London Jaguars fans tweeting at me yesterday that they weren't happy with it. They were like, yeah, yeah, we'd love to see more Jaguars, but not like this. You know what I mean? I feel like they would have preferred like a home and then away, but. If it's an away game, I'm not sh- I'm not positive, but if it's an away game, I don't think the Jags get the revenue from that. Yeah. Shouts out to my dog, Patrick Jackson, too, by the way. UK Jags <laughs> fan. Long-time yeah. subscriber of the channel, too. So. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it, was, it was certainly an interesting day. Um, it, it was the biggest news in the NFL uh, this week, obviously. You know, it hasn't overshadowed a Super Bowl at all, but it's the biggest news since the Super Bowl. And, you know, it's led to a lot of people in national media, outside analysts, to really raise their eyebrows, and it's justifiable. So, I mean, we'll see what comes of it. Uh, We'll see if it's only for 2020 or if it goes beyond that. And uh, really, it it feels kind of weird to say, but all you can do is wait and see, you know, when it comes to this kind of thing. So, we will uh, will wait and see, but that means uh, Jaguar Report will be coming live to you from Jacksonville on six Sundays as opposed to seven next season. But we're going to make those six Sundays count because that's what we do. Gee, but you, you, you got anything else on it? Because I, I, after that and the several London articles I have written, I'm about <laughs> ready to never hear the word London for, like, at least the next six months. <laughs> and that's all you're going to hear, I'm, I'm sure. But um, uh, 100%. Um, I would say, you know, my last piece on it is that I don't, as a personal opinion, I don't like the move. I get it. We've said this a million times in this podcast already. I get it, you know, but the fans' outrage is just, you know, ridiculous. And to see the outrage that's, you know, coming on and pouring on to the, um, as the fan base, you know, grows more and more knowledgeable about it. And like you said, players, uh, fans that are in the UK are even, you know, not approving this move. And, I would just like to see the Jaguars in the news for something positive for once. You know, it just, it seems like every time there's a big breaking story with Jacksonville, yeah. it's never positive. It's never in a good light and it sucks. But yeah, I mean, that, I, I, on that note, I, I, I do think, honestly, I mean, we can talk about really the most positive thing to happen to Jaguars in recent weeks. Uh, Blaze Campbell won Walter Payton Man of the Year. I mean, that's, that's like, legitimately one of the more, most prestigious awards in the NFL because it's basically given to the most respected dude in the NFL at that time because it's a sport on-field and off-field excellence. And uh, when you really – when I talked to Clayus about it, when he really got nominated, uh, he would tell me how during games he would, you know, uh, tell players how 
he, he it reminded me of Andrew Luck uh, getting sacked and then saying good job to the guys after he got hit because he was like I would always tell guys how great I think they were and stuff like that because I know how hard it is to be, be great at this game so just to see like Calais get recognized nationally and you know not only at the award show but at the Super Bowl and to see him win an award that is so really it it, it really basically creates the entire really personality of Clint Campbell. It kind of personifies it because Walter Payton Ward, it's about giving on and off the field. It's about being respected. It's about really setting an example of how to conduct yourself, not just as a player, but as a man and as a human being. And I can't think of anybody better just as a player than I met than Calais Campbell to win that award. Uh, he actually, he won the Jaguars local media good guy of the award also, which, you know, it's not quite the Walter Payton man of the year award, but, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's close. It's close. It's given, a, it's voted on by local media to uh, the Jaguars player that was really the best to work with in the locker room. And he's won it three years in a row, and he's been in Jacksonville for three years. So I, I, I was just so happy to see him win that. Yeah, I was super happy to see it too, you know, to see, um, a Jaguar representative, you know, get an award like that and to get it on the biggest stage possible, obviously a Super Bowl. It's huge. It's awesome. And, you know, I don't think I've really grown attached to a player so fast like I have with Calais Campbell. Yeah. Calais Campbell, such a nice guy, and he produces too, you know. Yeah, he's, he does the best defensive player the Jaguars have had in the last three years. I mean, he, he, he's already fourth in the franchise in sacks. You know, and I was going to bring that up, too, because I've I seen your tweets, like, the fall, like the past two, three days talking about, you know, Calais' stats, Calais' accolades and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, and then you have people talking about, like, should the Jaguars cut Calais Campbell Man. with the cap space? And there's absolutely – positively no way you can do that no way don't Here's do the Calais like that it makes sense on a spreadsheet in every other sense of the world it doesn't make any sense you know what I mean it makes sense from the fact that hey this team that doesn't have a lot of money uh you know in, just in terms of cap space hey they'd save a good amount of money by doing this but in terms of you'd be losing the heart and soul of your locker room you know, really the face of your team, the leader of your team. I mean, he, he's literally like the guy that players go to to talk to when they need to talk about something. You know, he's the guy that talks to them about not just football, but about life, how to really carry themselves. I mean, he, he was literally Josh Allen's mentor all season. So I, I, I think you just have to look at more than just numbers when you consider Calais. And I, I actually I did an article, I think it was on Monday, Monday or Tuesday, asking if he was – already a Jaguars legend, even though he's only been here for three years and he's only played 51 games counting the playoffs. I think when you look at his accolades here and his numbers here and the impact he's made on and off the field, I think after three years, he's already probably one of the top five Jaguars ever. I mean, would you agree with that? 100%. 100%. Even if he only plays one, two more years, like, I'd even put him in the pride. I'd even get, like, that bold to say that. Yeah, no, I – that I, I, I think so, too. I, I, I think when he hangs him up, I think e even if it was after this year, I think he'd be in the pride, honestly. He, he's not only, like, a mountain of a man, but, like, if you took him out of the Jaguars locker room, it's going to leave a big hole. And you already have so many problems in that team and in that organization already. You Why don't do you want to create another one? Yeah. yeah, you don't want to get rid of him. Like, it'd be almost like when – Maurice Jones-Drew called it a career, you know, like 2013 through like 2015. Obviously, prior to that, you know, with MJD, you know, the Jags had terrible seasons, but, you know, he was always around. But there was like that big hole lacking leadership in the locker room. And you're going to have that if you just get rid of Calais Campbell, especially if, you know, guys like Yannick and Gawkway aren't going to come back. Like, he means so much to the city of Jacksonville, to the team of the Jaguars, that he's already an all-time legend for the Jaguars – and you can't you can't let him go. There's no yeah. way. And, and and he can still play. <laughs> That's the big thing. Yeah, yeah. Like he was literally he was literally just a pro bowler, and he he didn't have he, he had probably his least productive season as a Jaguar, but he was still disruptive, man. You know, I mean, he, yeah. he still had a good season. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It, it, it was great to see uh, Calais win that. But before but the actually not it was like a few hours before, literally the same night 
that Calais won that award. It got announced that, um, you know, the Jaguars' uh, legendary left tackle, Tony Bazzelli, did not make it to Canton, did not make it to the Hall of yeah. Fame, despite being a finalist for the fourth year in a row. He made it to the top 10 of finalists out of the 15 for the third year in a row. And I, I, I got to be honest, this is the weakest Hall of Fame class of my memory. And he, he can't make it into that class. It, it's just tough for me to envision, man, because 2021 has Peyton Manning, Charles Woodson, and Calvin Johnson, <laughs> yeah. and Jared Allen. And that, that's, that's just the four first-year guys. You're not even talking about all the other guys who have been, like, denied for a few years. So, I think seeing him get passed over this year, I, I was honestly surprised. I predicted that he was actually going to get in this year just because, I mean, you look at the you look at the ballot and what, the only name that jumps off to you as a lock is Troy Polamalu, right? I mean, I, I don't think anybody would have said that, you know, Edger, Edger and James or – you know, Steve Hutchinson or Steve Atwater were uh, really locks for the Hall of Fame. So I thought that he would get in this year. And he, when he did it, I, I was honestly a good bit shocked. And I felt bad for Bazzelli just because, man, that, that has to be grueling for a guy. To, yeah. He literally gets invited to the site of the Super Bowl for the last four years to sit in a room and wait. And for four years in a row, he's gotten a call and been like, no, nah, not this year, man. I mean, that, that, that's got to be tough. That's got to hurt. I mean, I seen this tweet the other day that, honestly, I could see happening. And that was, like, a bold take that, like, Fred Taylor might get in before Baselli does. Uh, I, I don't, don't think know. so, man. I don't I don't know. Like, I, I, I think – I don't know. He hasn't I mean, been – has he been nominated yet? He, he, he was just a semifinalist for the first time ever this year. He's never even been a finalist. Like, Baselli at least is getting into the top that's 10. That's true. That's, That's my true. thing. Like I saw, had, I saw a lot yeah. of fans like say that same exact thing just because Fred has so many great stats. You know, he's top whatever in rushing, and most of the guys in front of him are in. But one of these guys has literally been close, and one of them has not. So I, 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 don't, I, I don't see a world where Fred Taylor is in the Hall of Fame and Tony Bozzelli isn't, even if, like, you could pro- maybe make the case that he should be. I just don't see how that's feasible, like, in reality. Do you see any other former Jaguar players like Fred Taylor like being nominated to be in the Hall no. of Fame anytime soon? Like a Jimmy Smith. Jimmy Smith like has a- the numbers, but I think both the market he played in and his off field stuff is gonna hurt him. Um What about MJD? You think down the line? Like I mean this is down down the line, obviously, but like down the line, you think an MJD might get some some nods? I don't At think least so. to be in there. No? I I I I'd be surprised if he's ever a finalist. Like, he, 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 he made the preliminary ballot this year, but he didn't make semifinalists. And I, I just – when you look at his numbers, they're impressive, but I think being in that committee for the first few years of his career and plus not having a super long career, I, I just don't see it. I, I, think, I think in order of likelihood, it would go Bozzelli, Taylor, Jimmy Smith. If Calais has two or three good more season, like more good seasons, like with – like seven to eight and more sacks in each season and he can get to 100 sacks I could maybe see Calais and then you have that argument hey is he going in as a Jaguar is he going in as a Cardinal I this is a bit of a hot take and it's one I put on Twitter and people weren't too fond of it my man uh, Richard Johnson SB Nation literally said man I hate you I could see a reality where Jalen Ramsey is the first player to be inducted into the Hall of Fame that was ever a Jacksonville Jaguar and Jalen mm. hates Jacksonville, and Jacksonville isn't very fond of Jalen. So I don't. I don't think so. No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't. No, no, I don't know. Who gets in before him? Tony, probably. <laughs> like, I mean, like he, he, could, he, he couldn't get in this year. He he, okay, he well, only when, he only has so many years as a as a modern era finalist. Anyways, he, it's not like he can be up for up for it every year. Eventually, he's going to be, like, one of those senior finalists. You think that Jalen would get in? Well, and, you know, Jalen probably – how many more years do you think Jalen got left? Probably nine, eight, nine, ten? Yeah, pro- probably about then. Then you add the five years he has to wait. Well, I mean, if he continues to play, like, you know, obviously he played in Jacksonville, small market. He has numbers. And then if he continues to be, like, a guy that, you know, plays for the Rams but isn't necessarily – terrific i i don't i don't see it i, I think he's gonna be a hall of famer i really do and i lean toward him getting in. 
yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I just I, – I think on the surface, Bazzelli is deserving of getting in just because they've let uh, – like Terrell Davis, you talk about longevity issues with Bazzelli. Terrell Davis literally played 71 games in his career. Tony Bazzelli yeah. played 20 more games than that. And I know Terrell Davis was a huge part of some Super Bowl teams, but the argument is longevity that I think you have to make the same argument for everybody. And when Bazzelli was playing, he was a top two to three left tackle of his era. So I, I think on the surface, he is deserving. You just have to have the right year. And this, in my opinion, should have been the year. So if this wasn't the year. I, I just – I got to wonder when it will be, man, because it just doesn't seem like – boaters are really drinking the Kool-Aid. I don't think so either. And and I was going to go back to the Calais thing too because uh, you read my mind too. I, I swear this whole podcast you've been reading my mind. You've been That's saying what I do. That's why they pay me the big bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You read minds out here. But um, Calais, I was thinking that exact same thing. I was like, if he ret- – even like when he retires, like I wonder if he's going to – I feel like he – I don't – My one of my best friends is a huge Cardinals fan. You know, and, I, and I'm sure he did great things while he was in Arizona. He was probably a great guy for the community there. But, you know, for what he's done in Jacksonville as a leader and as a player. He's had a wonder, more successful time in Jacksonville. Yeah, I wonder – do you think he'd go back and just sign a – because the players don't really do that anymore. Do you think that he'd sign a contract with Arizona you, to retire? You see it now and then. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think when you look at it from an impact point of view and an accolade point of view – I mean, Calais has made five Pro Bowls and one All-Pro team in his career. Uh, two of those Pro Bowls came in nine years of Arizona. The other three Pro Bowls and the only All-Pro team, they literally came with Jacksonville. I mean, Calais Campbell was a known name with the Cardinals, but I don't think he was as household as he is here with Jacksonville. You know, I mean, I li- literally has like a nickname that he's known for around the league, you know, the mayor. So – I would make that argument, and then you throw in the Walter Payton Award and then the Bart Starr Award he won last year, and just how he's revered in Jacksonville. I I would argue that he's done more in his career for the Jaguars than for the Cardinals. And when you look at it from a production standpoint, I wrote down the numbers uh, the other day, but he averaged something like .41 sacks per game with the Cardinals, and he's averaged like .68 with the Jaguars. So he's produced more with the Jaguars too, so – it's a tough one. I mean, I, I'm not really sure. I, I, honestly, Calais in our conversations in the locker room has not talked about Arizona a ton. So I'm sure, you know, you play anywhere for nine years. It's going to mean a lot to you. But I, I really don't know. But it, if, if he played a few more years in Jacksonville, then I, I could see it be, like, a pretty good question. But, you know, for now, it's nine years versus three years. So he's going to play a little bit longer. But it, it's a good question. I, I, I think if he can get over 100 sacks, which he should if he keeps playing for a few years, he might have a chance just because I like how respected he is, but that that's about the gist, I think. Well, one more, one more retirement question for you. So we don't get too off track in this podcast. Sure. Um, Mercedes Lewis, you think he signs a day contract to retire in Jacksonville? I don't know. Cause it didn't seem like their, their divorce was all that positive. I didn't think so either, but yeah. I mean, you see, he, how, how long was he in Jacksonville? That was 12 years. Something like that. I, yeah. I, I had the opinion then that he should have got the send-off that Paul Pazlesny got. Paul Pazlesny got an entire press conference. He wasn't even drafted by the Jaguars. And and was Puzzles Puzz only around for like five, six, wasn't he? Like five, six years? I think he got there in 20, 2012. So 2012 through 2017, yeah. Yeah, Mercedes deserved that so hard. Like Mercedes was one of the first Jaguar yeah. players like I weird. fell in love with. Yeah. Like it, it was weird. I love Mercedes, and like before that was Rasheen Mathis. I really loved Rasheen Mathis too. Yeah, Rasheen but. was good, man. R- 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 Rasheen is a the hall of underrated. You know, we'll never we'll never once breathe in Canton, but he he's the hall of underrated, dude. He he was he was a good player. But he was um, the first ahead. player I probably was like my favorite player. Honestly, yeah, yeah, no, R- Rasheen was nice. But um, yeah. So I, like I said, I was surprised by that news. A lot of fans were disappointed by it, but. At the end of the day, it, it just doesn't seem like, like we said, the voters are really on the Bazzelli wagon. So that, that brings us to the last thing I wanted to talk about for a few minutes. Uh, while I was in Mobile for the Senior Bowl, the Jaguars found a new offensive coordinator. They hired uh, Jay Gruden, from uh, former head coach of Washington from 2014 until 
week five in 2019. He was the Cincinnati Bengals offense coordinator for 2011 to 2013. They went to the playoffs all three years, and uh, he was Andy Dalton's first, like, play caller and really kind of, like, offensive mentor for the first three years of his career. And, I mean, he helped Kirk Cousins develop from a backup that nobody had really ever, like, given second thought to, a guy who got, you know, one of the largest guaranteed contracts of all time. So that was a big move. Uh, Tree, what, what was your real uh, reaction to the Gruden hiring? And do you think it was a good choice to replace John DePlippa? It depends on what the Jaguars do at the quarterback position, in my opinion. Like, if this is a situation where the Jaguars do a Jaguars thing and they want to just trot Nick Foles out there just for the hell of it, I don't think it's going to be great. But if you get him to mentor a young Gardner Minshew, this might just be a home run move, in my opinion. Because Gardner Minshew, you know, when mm-hmm. through his JUCO career and through Eastern Carolina, he was never really a guy that produced, you know, the numbers that he was able to produce. You put him with a guy that had a great mind with how to groom quarterbacks and Mike Leach, and he excelled. And then you put him in a situation with a coordinator like John DeFilippo, who had, like, no real – idea on how to you know cater plays to Gardner and he still put up good numbers still won six games you put him with a guy that has a QB mind like Jay Gruden this might be a really really good pickup it's it's a it's a teetering teetering deal I don't think it has potential to be really bad which that's good that's good for the Jaguars because you know typically it's really bad I was gonna say I, I I don't see it as a move that could like backfire on them you know like I think if they're bad next year I don't think it's going to be because of Jay Gruden no it's either going to be really really good or really average like I don't see it being terrible yeah I and I, I think it's a good move for Gruden too because he can point like hey the Jaguars were a mess when I got here it's not it's not my fault you know things went yeah, south exactly so exactly. I mean and if he can do well you know with Minshew or even with Foles that can only help him get back into the head coaching game so Maybe for the Jaguars, man. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's a fair question, you know. Uh, uh, Doug Marone literally said on uh, the conference call after he hired Gruden, he said a lot of times there's a learning curve with inexperienced coordinators and stuff like that. And then he stopped and he goes, I don't have time for that curve. <laughs> I'm yeah, like, yeah. yeah, he knows. Like, he he yeah. knows his leash is not exactly long. And he even said, like, a few different times, with the kind of situation that we're in. So he, he knows that they have to win now, and I think this was a move to win now. I, I don't think there's any way Jay Gruden is still offensive coordinator in Jacksonville in, like, two seasons because either everybody's gotten fired and he's gone elsewhere or been promoted to head coach, or they've done so well that he's been hired as a head coach somewhere else, you know? So I don't yeah. think this is like, okay, we have our next offensive coordinator for – Minshew's like career I think this is to help him here in this early part of his career that makes sense yeah I'd say that makes sense and I'd say like if the Jags you know produce on offense you know say have like a top 13 top 12 offense Minshew has a really good season and they still you know hover around that six win five win mark and Doug gets fired I think there's a lot of opportunity for Jay to move up you know, because the Jaguars like doing that. You know, it's proven yeah. with Doug Marone during Sean Conn's tenure that Jay Gruden might move up and become the head coach of the Jaguars, and maybe that's going to be, you know, a finesse move that gets the Jags out of the rut. You know, this might be a whole storyline, but, yeah. you know, obviously it's still in the early stages. But I, I like the move for sure. I think, it's, I think it's good. If they had fired Doug Marone in January and then gone on to hire Jay Gruden as head coach, I don't think that's a move that you could criticize too much. So I think just getting him in as offensive coordinator, I, I, I think it's the best hire the Jaguars could have made because they, they, in, they interviewed, at least we know publicly, three guys, him, Scott Linehan, and Ben McAdoo. I actually think Ben McAdoo, when you look at his track record as an offensive coordinator, he was actually a pretty good offensive coordinator. But Scott Linehan was the definition of, like, at mediocrity. So I think when you stack those three guys together – Jay Gruden was about as good as you can get, man. I mean, he had some really good offenses in Cincinnati as a whole reason he had a head coaching job in Washington to begin with. And we saw what he did with Kirk Cousins. Uh, Alex Smith was actually playing well before he got hurt. And 
I don't think you can really point to anything in Washington and say, okay, well, Gruden did this so bad in Washington that we should be worried and that they should be worried in Jacksonville because Washington, I mean, when you consider NFL franchises that are a mess, Jacksonville might come up, but Washington <laughs> is the first team that you think of. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think Jay Gruden was the best possible uh, scenario. The only other guy I would like to see just for personal reasons would have been Kellen Moore, but you know, that's a guy that I think Dallas is grooming to have around long-term. Yeah. And I mean, like the Jaguars would only just be listening to Treve Talks content and Jaguar Report podcast content if they hired freaking Kellen Moore as the head coach and Byron Leftwich was the OC and Minshew was the you know face of the franchise. So <laughs> I don't think they're going to be doing that, but that's my no. ideal situation. I, I do think though, I, I think the Gruden hiring bodes well for Minshew starting in 2020. I do too. I do too, 100. percent If you think about it. If you can turn Minshew into Dalton or Cousins, for a six-round pick, that's pretty good. And stylistically, he's similar to both those guys. The one thing he does better is make plays out of structure and with his legs. But, I mean, just as a passer, he's kind of similar to both those guys. So, I, I, I can see Gruden really meshing really well with him. I'd agree with that. I think that that was the first thing that actually came to my mind was Jay Gruden's worked with two quarterbacks that are very similar in Minshew's yeah. – uh, you know, style of play. Yeah, and, and he loves using play action. Yeah, and Minshew's, you know, adds another element to Jay, uh, to the offense that those two quarterbacks couldn't. So, I mean, that makes it even, you know, a better project for Gruden to work on, I'd say. Yeah, and I mean, I, I did an article last week where I looked at Minshew's uh, 12 starts in uh, 2019, and then I looked at Kirk Cousins' first 12 starts, Andy Dalton's first 12 starts. Minshew blew both those guys out of the water number wise, like not even close in any, and it had more touchdowns, more yards per attempt, more yards adjusted, better completion percentage, fewer interceptions. The only thing he, uh, he had a lot more rushing yards, obviously. The only thing he did worse than those guys was he fumbled. And I think the bright, the positive that you can look to is Minshew didn't fumble when he got the job back in the second half of the year. Like he, he didn't yeah. lose one fumble. So hopefully he, you know, flipped that switch because 13 fumbles and like uh, seven and eight games at the first half of the year, that's pretty horrifically bad. Uh, he only lost seven of them, of course. But other than fumbles, he was better than a young Dalton and a young Cousins in every single regard. And Dalton had like A.J. Green and Gruden as his offense coordinator. Kirk Cousins had Gruden and other weapons on offense. Minshew had Shark and uh, Dave Filippo and Fournette. Shark and Fournette had great years, but Dave Filippo isn't exactly an established offensive mind. And then around him, he didn't exactly have a bounty of weapons. So I think we, when you can consider the fact that a young Minshew is already off to a better start than Dalton and Cousins were when Gruden started working with them, or when he even – like it, obviously Dalton's first year was under Gruden. I think this is a positive sign moving forward for Minshew and his relationship with Gruden. And, uh, Treep, I wanted to get your take on this. A lot of people say that Gruden's offense is, can be pretty layered and nuanced and complicated and can take a young quarterback some time to learn. Just being somebody that, you know, has watched Minshew for as long as you have, do you think this is something that he could actually, like, pick up at a quicker pace just because of his really knowledge of the game and his smarts off the field? I would say so. I'd say that, you know, his love for the game is going to help him a lot. And I think, you know, his willingness to work is going to benefit him a lot in Jay Gruden's system. I mean, he's already doing some offseason stuff to get ready for next season. So, you know, it's clear, uh, at least from the interviews he does and from, you know, the work that he's going to be putting in this offseason, that he wants to be the quarterback of Jacksonville's future and he wants to be that guy. But uh, I would say Mike Mike Leach's offense – in Washington State was also a lot of, you know, quarterbacks calling the play at the line of scrimmage. So obviously with Minshew's experience, being able to call plays on the fly at the line of scrimmage during the, you know, during the play, I think with just that football knowledge, you know, I think he's going to be able to get Jake Gruden's uh, playbook down like the back of his hand, I would say. Yeah, for sure. And I, I'm with you. It really seems like Minshew's a guy that really picks things up quickly. All right. Well, I mean, you know, we, we, we hit the big things that we want to talk about, 
Chief, I'm going to hit you with one smaller question and discussion. Does the Jaguars playing two games in London change how many games that you think they win next year? <sighs> no. Well, I mean, like, it depends on, like, how high your expectations are for this team, I think. Yeah. I mean, like, I, I mean, if you're, if you're just going to judge it by how it is, you know, in 2018, 2019, where, you know, six is – six, five and – five wins, six wins is the ceiling. I mean, I – I guess not. I guess it doesn't really impact that because, I mean, I'd hope the Jags could put together five, six wins next year uh, just based on talent. And hopefully, you know, a full year with Gardner Minshew, that might help a little bit, new offensive coordinator. Um, I don't think it affects it too much from the standpoint of how many wins the Jaguars have had in past seasons. And um, so, you know, it's not going to hurt them. Or I don't think it's going to hurt them too bad because, yeah. you know, it's a team that doesn't win too much. So, I, I was no. going to say, and I mean, you look at London and people that may call it a competitive advantage, they're 0-2 there in the last two years. They've been outscored 50-21, to 21, including a terrible 20-6 to 6 blowout loss versus the Houston Texans last year. But then in 2017, they beat the Ravens 44-7. to 7. So I, I, I think it depends on the team. I think if you're a good team, uh, it can kind of amplify you maybe. And I think if you're a struggling team, it can only really hurt you. Like playing in London isn't really going to, you know, rejuvenate your struggling football team or anything like that. So it, it's it's tough for me to say. I think having to play that back-to-back, I could see that honestly, like taking some fatigue on them. And it, it, if they go 0-2 in London next year, and I don't even know who they're playing there, if they went 0-2 in London just for the fact that they have to spend two weeks over there, I wouldn't be overly surprised. No, and and you know this is gonna be because could you imagine if this two game and obviously you know looking back at it the Jags did lose those games when they were kind of I think it was like week when the Jags were in the playoff race you know when they were in the division race and then they ended up losing those games when Foles came back could you imagine if those two games were in London that'd be all they talk about so I mean I'm really hoping that these two games either come. I'd hope they come really early in the season. That's I, what I would like. I think they're going to come in like October. Yeah, so that would yeah, that'd be like Mid, middle of the season, like, like around five, week six. eight, week nine. No, I, yeah. I think I think around like when it came this year, like around week eight, week nine. So it'd be like week eight, week nine, and then they'd have a bye week ten. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, would, depend, depending where they play before London, they could go over a month without playing in Jacksonville, and they did that last year. Yeah, man, that's. Yeah, that's that's something. <laughs> well, we'll just go right back to talking about the London thing if we get too into that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, Treve, uh, I I don't really have much else. I think we kind of covered all the bases for what's happened in the last week or so uh, this off season. Um, is that you have anything else that you want to say to the folks? Uh, always got to have a parting hot take, obviously. But before I do that parting hot take, uh, I just want you guys to know. Um, if you could subscribe to my YouTube channel at Dream Talks, um, I have a new podcast out every week where I just sit down and discuss things with some people. I had a Jacksonville native on there last week. His name was Chance James. He's a personal trainer. He gave a lot of information about how to build your own business, how to be a successful entrepreneur. You can see little clips of that uh, either on my Instagram or on my Twitter. Uh, those are at Dream Talks, both of them. And uh, make sure you subscribe so you check out that good content as well. And I think John's going to be on the podcast soon too, so that should be that should be fun. I'm excited to have him on there. But my parting hot take is is Kokanee is a pretty good beer. I'd say top ten for me. Mm, my my parting hot take is beer isn't that great, but they, they, John, it's, it's all right. It's all right. John, John, all right. John, John. It's all right. But I mean. <laughs> <laughs> on, on that note, uh, if I had any uh, parting hot take, oh, man, it would probably be that Calais Campbell will not only be a Jaguar next season, but he will make his fourth consecutive Pro Bowl with the Jaguars, and he will end up retiring as a Jaguar a few years down the road and eventually get inducted into the ring. I would agree with that 100%. Yeah, it it, 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 it that. ended on a positive note. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. everybody, uh, thank you as always for tuning in. Uh, thank you for supporting Jaguar Report. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to be here all offseason long. 
we're doing literally multiple articles a day. You're not going to wake up and see, you know, articles from three days ago on the front site. You know, you're going to see new stuff every day. So thank you for supporting us and sticking with us. And thank you for supporting the podcast. Uh, it means a lot to Treeb and I. Treeb, you got anything else? I'd like to give a big shout out to John Shipley. He's out working everybody. He's a hard worker. Obviously, we got a team on the map, but everybody's busy. And, you know, he's still mostly the guy that's putting all those things on the front page. So, John, you're doing a great job. And I'd like to thank you guys again for watching this podcast because it's really fun. I like talking to John. and I like talking to Jags. And, you know, I like talking to the fans. So, thank you guys so much for listening. I appreciate it, big dog. All right, everybody. Thanks again. Until next time.